Now for our design challenge, we don't want to just run a 1D model on two processors. How can we run a code with over a trillion grid cells? Well, we can extend the strategy we just used in one dimension, and we can apply it to a 2D or 3D FTTD code. For example, say I have a two-dimensional code here. And let's say I want to distribute it onto four processors. So I'll distribute it onto two in each direction. In this case, instead of sending just one number to a neighboring processor, as we did in one dimension here, one number back and forth, in two dimensions, we would need to send a line of data, say this line over to here, and a line of data, one line of data, then the other direction as well. And it'd be the same thing for this direction also. A line between all the different processors. And in three dimensions, try to draw a box. You know, say we're cutting this in half, then we'll need to send a plane of data between the two processors. If I was cutting a three-dimensional code in half. And of course in three dimensions we could divide up the code in all three Cartesian directions so we could need to send data to up to six processors, one corresponding to each side of a cubic subgrid that is hosted on each processor. It turns out that having roughly 25 to say 50 grid cells in each direction, each Cartesian direction is optimal. Uh, 3D codes can run very fast in this case. And for three-dimensional models, if we start to have more than, say, 100 cells in each direction on the processor, we start to run the risk of running out of memory on each processor. And the code also starts to run slowly, because each processor has, to, has too many cells to update. So about 25 to 50 cells per processor. Of course, at the other extreme, if we put too few cells on each processor, then sending data between processors becomes the bottleneck. Okay, now let's see where we're at with our design challenge. We just developed a tool that we can use to create very large Maxwell's equations models of cell-friendly light interacting with a collection of micrometer-sized biological cells. And this large model has a high enough resolution that we can include nanometer-sized features of the biological cells. We could use this large FDTD model to see if we can develop a new imaging technology. And we want this new imaging technology to allow us to study the behavior of cells in the early stages of cancer, detect cancer development. And of course, you may have guessed, it turns out that there is a group led by Professor Vadim Bachman. He's at Northwestern University that is running exactly these kinds of FDTD models with over a trillion grid cells in order to develop ultra-early stage cancer detection technologies. For their work until recently, they were using the petascale supercomputer called Mira, which was hosted at the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Labs. What they did was they built an FDTD model that they call Angora, and they refer to this model as a microscope in a computer. Because it models the four components of an optical imaging system, they, it includes illumination, scattering, collection, and refocusing. And by the way, this code is available for free on GitHub. They are using this tool to detect features and the movement of molecules within living cells at scales smaller than what is physically possible using a regular optical microscope, which we talked about in lecture 19. They call the approach that they are using partial wave spectroscopy, or PWS, which involves studying how the light is reflected by cells, including the angle of the scattered waves and different frequencies. For example, using PWS, they discovered that there is a burst of mag 
macromolecular activity or motion that occurs inside of cells at the moment that a cell starts to die. Here's an example of this. The first image at the top shows a healthy cell with lots of motion occurring inside of the cell. So this is plotting fractional moving mass and the color bar here, red, indicates more mo motion and co corresponds to the amount of moving mass in the cell. And the length of the white bar here is 7 micrometers to give you kind of a scale. The second image shows a stressed cell that is being exposed to harmful UV radi irradiation. You can see that there is a lot less motion going on inside of the cell. Then the third image shows a burst of macromolecular motion occurring inside of the cell as the cell starts to die. It's dying as a result of the UV rays. Interestingly, they found that this process occurs synchronously within a cell. So across the cell, we see all this movement going on at the same time, even though the cell spans 30 micrometers. But this activity occurs asynchronously with other cells. Like There's another cell maybe over here and over here. So it's occurring asynchronously with those other cells. And by the way, the time scale here for all this occurring is on the order of milliseconds. And the fourth image at the bottom shows the reduced macro, macromolecular motion immediately after the cell has died. So they're using PWS to understand the behavior and what's going on inside cells uh, while they're stressed and as they're dying. Also using PWS, they were able to study chromatin inside of cells. They learned that when chromatin packing inside of a cell is heterogeneous and disordered, like on the left, this is an artist's rendition of this, then the cell in this case is stronger and it, and it can demonstrate more resistance to outside stresses. But when the chromatin packing is neat and ordered, the cell cannot respond as easily to outside stressors, so it's more vulnerable. They are using this information to develop new cancer therapies that target chromatin packing. If they can cause the chromatin packing in cancer cells to become neat and ordered, so this is the more vulnerable scenario, then those cancer cells become more vulnerable to traditional treatments for cancer at smaller doses. In other words, large FDTD models solving Maxwell's equations and running on some of the world's best supercomputers are providing clues about the basic functions of biological cells. And this is information that scientists can use to develop er ultra early stage cancer detection technologies and also to develop better therapies to treat cancer. Well, we've reached the end of this design challenge and also the end of the FDTD section of this course.